Coming up on Across the Chains, the music NFT spectacular. My two guests today are Italian musician Violetta Zeroni and 3D OG and musician Tony Parisi. Plus, WorldCoin releases its eyeball biometric currency. And Unisat is rumored to be raising at a $50 million valuation and is in talks with Binance. All of this and more coming up on Across the Chains. Hello, guys. It's me, Corval, here. Today's show would not be possible without our sponsor, Shimmer Network. Just as a reminder, Shimmer is a DAG-based, feeless, layer one network that's both fast and highly scalable. You can learn more about them at shimmer.network. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the show. With me today is Tony Parisi and Violetta Zeroni. So hello, Violetta. How are you? Good morning. Uh, thank you so much for having me, having us. I'm really good. I'm very excited to be here. Yeah. Yeah, we're very excited to have both of you. I mean, as, as we were discussing before the show, this is mostly a nerd show. So we're kind of excited to get into exciting things like music and NFTs and sort of a it's a, it's a detour for us, but I think it'll be a fun one. So hello, Tony. How are you doing, man? Hey, Mark. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. So uh, for those of you who don't know, Tony and I are old friends uh, going back. I mean, going back like 30 years, although we didn't really meet back then. We sort of started life together as, as metaverse enemies in the uh, late 90s. So when I was running, I think, all the palace. And Tony is one of the co-creators of VRML. And uh, right. So and then I'm trying, I'm trying to figure out how to describe you because you've done so many things. I, I 3D OG was the best I could come up with. But why don't you give us a quick introduction to you and your past? Yeah, so uh, you mentioned VRML. It was the first 3D standard for uh, the Internet. So 3D models could be transmitted over the wire, you know, over dial-up modems at the time in the 90s. Um, delivered into your web browser and you can interact with them, click on them, and then you could visit other 3D worlds or experience other 3D content with that. I've been working on file formats like that on and off for the last 30 years. So VRML was very early, very early. Like I said, dial-up modems, laptop computers. We didn't have these supercomputers in our pockets, you know, smartphones like we do now. Uh, we didn't even have all the 3D graphics hardware to make that stuff run really fast and look really beautiful like we do now for video games. So all of that has changed in the last 30 or so years. And... I continue to work on 3D standards for that. Most recently, something called GLTF, which has been around for about 10 years and is now being used in every application that does 3D that's connected on a mobile phone or on the internet. So if you've got snap lenses, Instagram filters, 3D models in your PowerPoint that you can spin around, virtual worlds people deliver in a web browser, all that content's built on GLTF, a standard that I was one of the designers of. Uh, in addition to that, I'm a software engineer and entrepreneur who's been doing startups for that whole period of time we were talking about, Mark. I was building virtual world startups based on VRML back in the 90s. And then uh, I was an executive at Unity, the game engine company, for six years running VR and AR for them until a few years ago. And then most recently, I joined a company called Lamina One, which I've since left. And I'll get to that part of the story in a second. Uh, which is a blockchain company for building metaverse applications, the open metaverse. So focused on 3D media still. Founded by Neil Stevenson, the fellow who wrote this novel, Snow Crash, which coined the term metaverse, right? So full circle in a really odd turn of events, I went, went to work with Neil for about 15 months and recently just quit that job and hope to say goodbye to my tech exec life for the rest of my career and just focus on my music because I'm also a musician, but I'm sure. We'll get to that story. So, yeah. We'll um, definitely get to that. Yeah. And so, yeah, been doing 3D tech and standards for a long time, you know, trying to dog food it, as they say, in the industry with content creators and decided at some point, I, I got to really be on the content side of this. So here I am. Yeah, the content side is probably the more fun side. So, Violetta, let's let's hear a little bit about you. So you you are a musician. Tell, tell us a little bit about your career before you did the music project that we're going to talk about in a few minutes. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm, I've been a musician for 10 years. Uh, I, you know, I grew up in a little town in Italy and I've, I've been, been playing music my whole life. And when I was 18 years old, I participated at um, the uh, singing competition TV show X Factor. 
Uh, and yeah. I got, yeah, and I, I got to the final. I was still in school, but I got to the final and was offered a major label deal, which I signed. And so that's kind of how my career started. Um, and, you know, very quickly, I realized that, um, you know, that, you know, utopian record deal that I'd wanted uh, so much was not what I expected, right? Because obviously, what they say is true, but not a lot of people talk about it. When they offer you a 360 deal, it means that you have no power control over anything, mm, your creativity, your your business, your finances, nothing. Um, and I didn't quite know what I wanted to do, but I knew that I did not want to do what they were telling me to do. And I'm so, still- so when Pink Floyd does the like have a cigar. Uh, Welcome to the Machine songs where they talk about the music industry and you hear stories like um, Paul McCartney losing the the Beatles catalog and uh, like uh, and Billy Joel, like, you know, losing the rights to his songs. This is what you're talking about is this nightmare right here. Yes, 100 percent for sure. And of course, at the time I was only 18 uh, and I just jumped into it without even thinking about it. You know, it was pretty much they lured me into it very, very well. Um, but it's okay. You know, it was a great learning experience. I'm glad it happened earlier rather than later. So, you know, I had time to get out of it and learn from my mistakes, which I did. Um, and then since then, you know, I just developed my independent, um, artist career by just performing. I played hundreds of shows. I wrote hundreds of songs. I've had songs in movies, commercials. I played in movies myself as an actor, um, and this went on for about, yeah, seven, eight years where I just kind of tried to make it work as an independent musician and was always blessed, you know, to uh, make enough money to pay my bills. I never had a, a different job, which I'm grateful for. Hmm. Um, but of course, you know, I've always had a lot of issues with the current state of the music industry, which is relying on algorithms pretty much where you put out your music on streaming platforms and you have no chance to really, you know, rise to the surface unless, you know, you find some weird hacks to trick the algorithm, which I didn't think a musician should be thinking about that. Uh, You know, a musician should connect directly to their audiences. And, you know, it, it became really, really difficult, but I gathered a lot of experience. And yeah, about 18 months ago, I found Web3 very strangely, uh, thanks to my mother, who knew about Web3 before I did. (laughs) And he kind of introduced me to it. And so, yeah, here I am. Wow, that's super fascinating. So you so you actually been through the the record industry and that machine. And then your mom comes along. Was your mom like into crypto? Like, was she a Bitcoiner? No, but she's not a Bitcoiner. She's just. How does your mom know about Web3? That's what I'm trying to figure out. Yeah, um, I know it's bizarre. She is just very curious. She's just a very open minded, curious woman. You know, she's 60, uh, around 60 years old. But um, I feel like, you know, she lives in my little town in Italy, but she just knows a lot about everything. And, uh, and she's always trying to find opportunities for her kids. You know, she says, you guys have no excuse. You have to try everything. And technology is the future. And if you miss it, you miss out. You get left behind. And so she didn't quite know what it meant, but she had a feeling and I followed her advice. So so she was like, over here is where you need to go. So let's talk about what you did and show a little bit of it. Um, so you find Web3 and you see this world of NFTs and board apes and all this crazy stuff on OpenSea. Um, and you come along and you decide to do uh, music NFTs, which to be honest with you, I hadn't really heard of many, I hadn't heard of anybody doing music NFTs. I knew it was sort of possible and, but I hadn't really seen anyone sort of put all the pieces together. So this is, this is your collection on OpenSea. Let me scroll to the top here. So you can see it's called Moonshots. And this is one of two collections. I think this is your first collection, correct? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, there's 2,500 items. Um, and they, they kind of look like this. So it's it's generative art, it appears to me. Although I know that some of this was hand-drawn, I think, by your father also, right? Yeah, it's actually all hand-drawn. All the traits and the layers are hand-drawn by my dad. My dad's a Disney artist. He just draws comics for Disney for a living for a long time. And, you know, we collaborated on this. And it is all hand-drawn. He'd never done it before. But, of course, it's... Uh, you know, layered and we generated the 2,500 items with, with, with an algorithm pretty much that, you know, made sure they were all unique. So. Yeah. 
So then when I, so basically the, it's, it's an image, but also there's this little play button here. And if I click play, I'll hear, there are five songs that are part of this collection. And each one of these images randomly has one of the five songs assigned to it. So I'm going to play a little, is that correct or not? Well, not exactly randomly. So it's almost like it's five collections. As you can see, you know, the five different designs have each 500 variations. So it's like five artwork covers with 500 different versions. Uh, but, you know, the one with the spaceship is one song. The one with the spider is a different song. And you always, you can recognize which oh, song is by the art. Yeah. Got it. So the spaceship one is always the same song. So right. let, me, let, me, let me play a little bit of it so people can hear it. I would cross the universe and circle around the sun To find that little part of my heart I'd never know And I would give up everything I would defy gravity Cause something's out there telling me I am not alone in Okay so I didn't want to play the whole thing, but that was that. That's great. So, um, so you put these out, and when did you actually put these out? Like when? When did this happen? It was April 2022. That was about three months after I'd first heard of Web three. So I, I went in pretty pretty fast. <laughs> wow. Okay. And then how did you? So how did you find someone who knew their way around actually creating the generative art? Like where? How did? What was that journey like? Yeah, really good question. Because obviously, when I first came in, I had no clue. Not I had no clue about anything. I had no clue about crypto wallets, nothing. So I really had some catching up to do. But thankfully, I through Twitter spaces, really, because that's obviously where the community hangs out. I realized that there was a music community already It was small, and very niche. But uh, one of the one of the most successful at the time music NFT artists is actually an Italian saxophone player uh, who I connected with. His name is Nifty Sax. And he had put out a very successful, also kind of generative in that sense, collection a few months before, um, was really successful. And he had just started some kind of like artist incubator. He had teamed up with the dev um, and they were helping artists launch their collections and guide them through it. And uh, I reached out not knowing they had this project going on. And he actually told me, it's like, it's good you reached out because, you know, we, we're just starting this venture. Um, so we started working together. I was their first artist. And I do owe a lot to them, you know, because the way the collection is structured, the rarities, the frames that define the, you know, the rarity level and the utilities that are attached. We built this whole thing from nothing pretty much in just a month or so. Um, so yeah, really shout out to them and the dev, uh, Wazy is still, still my dev. So, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Cause it, it feels, I mean, Tony, you had some thoughts on this. The, the music business is broken. Um, you know, Spotify, you know, I, I you, you guys know, I like, I'm, I'm a, I'm a complete amateur musician, but I put out an album also. So I've been through this process of, you know, just put, you know, how do you put it up on Spotify, blah, blah, blah. How do you promote it? And it just doesn't, it doesn't, none of it feels good. So Tony, you had some thoughts on this issue. So speak to that. Well, yeah, and I'll, I'll do it by way of just telling my backstory on this and my, about my current music project a little bit. We can unpack it later, but um, I've been a lifelong musician long before I got into the tech business. And I was thinking pretty hard about going deep into the music business back in the eighties. And I was in bands. And uh, in fact, some of my bandmates ended up going on to be, pretty successful indie musicians on their, in their own right and having their own creator battles later on. Um, but I decided instead to pursue a career in tech. And, and when I made that split, though, I never stopped doing music. And I worked on a bunch of music projects, um, including writing this full musical about the end of the world, which we'll talk about a bit, called Judgment Day. And I finally recorded all the demos for Judgment Day and started making a record in the period between 2021, uh, 2020 and 2022. So during COVID lockdown, I recorded the demos. In 2021, I recorded the album and I started thinking about how I was going to release it. Meanwhile, I've been watching the evolution of digital music, everything from file sharing, you know, Napster and LimeWire and the basically theft of all IP <laughs> to you know the big the big labels coming and saying you can't steal that's you can't steal those artists IP that's our IP striking deals and creating the streaming services like Spotify and you know 
doing all these deals uh, to make it so that people are legally streaming the music, but they forgot uh, one little thing, which is actually to be able to pay the artists fairly. So when you watch this and you see what the take rates are like, it's it's absolutely ridiculous. You know, a million streams gets you three thousand dollars in revenue on Spotify, and think about what it takes to actually get a million streams and what kind of promotion you need to do. And artists need well, to what independent artists talking. need to yeah yeah exactly. So Violetta was talking about, about gaming yeah. the algorithm on Spotify, right? So because uh, after you put your album up, right, how do you get people to listen to it? That's the you, big. Uh, you pay to get on playlists. You work really hard to find influencers. You try and game the algorithm. Yeah, yeah. Shake your booty like people are doing on TikToks now, doing ridiculous things to get. Well, there's all kinds of like scams, like doing. pay me and I will get you on playlists on Spotify, right? Because I've, I've been yeah. through this because I put I yeah. put an album up and I'm like, okay, yeah. how do You've I promote it? it? Like, there's no good way to do it, and it just looks like you you throw money after money after money, and and you don't really get listens. Even even if yeah. it's good stuff, right? Like there's like um, there's there's no radio station you can go to. You know that if you could play it on this radio station, you're going to get listeners. That doesn't really exist in Spotify world, right? So yeah, yeah. There's all that, and I mean we can we can unpack that at, at length. And you know, Violetta went through this too, where she was just you know questioning whether you know she wanted to even keep going on this. And you know, so for me, this is what I was thinking about a lot a couple of years ago, as I wanted to get Judgment Day heard in the world. And I was also already in crypto. I was starting to buy art NFTs, visual art NFTs. And I was curious about what was going on in music land so that I could see if maybe there was a way to release my music as NFTs. And just started innocently, you know, sort of searching around for people talking about this. And I found Violetta. I found Violetta and a couple mm. of other musicians early in 2022 talking about their projects and i went on a twitter space and violetta's talking about the moonshot collection she hadn't dropped it yet all these cool utilities she was going to have around it and i'm like wait you how can you do that with an audio file and a bitmap like you need to write a smart contract right how the there's no platforms right. that are doing this this is you know a service like royal there were a couple of people coming out but it was like this sounds like really custom and violetta said this 27 year old italian singer songwriter <laughs> <laughs> little girl says i hired an engineer i hired a dev and i'm like <laughs> what is going on <laughs> like she's her own basically she's her own music label she's doing the entire stack herself everything the promotion the development the distribution i'm like wow this is really something web3 is incredible it's giving people these tools that really empower them it seems like a lot of work but at least they're going direct to their fans they're keeping most of the money they make they're sharing it with the developer they're, you know, everyone's getting their fair share as part of the supply chain. So that was a light bulb moment for me. And I started, A, collecting Violetta's music because I adore it. And then I found a half a dozen other musicians I really, really like. And I started collecting their NFTs. And that was an investment for me, an investment in their career, uh, an investment in maybe some of these artists actually blowing up. So it's a bit speculative. Like, you know, if you had some rare recording of Bruce Springsteen from some one show, right? Boom, you, that might be a collector's item at some point. So I was very interested in that. It's like having an old me, Elvis 45 from the 50s or something like oh, that. Oh, imagine what that's yeah. worth now. Right. And so, you know, there's some of that, but there's also for me, it was kind of research for me. And, and, and you know, I really wanted to figure out how this was being done for my uh, own art as well. And along that way and along that journey, I really became attuned to how bad it is in the current music industry. I mean, we could go on at length about this. But the streaming services really are not returning what the artists need. And so independent artists in particular are up in arms. But I, even established artists, if you saw Snoop Dogg rant about this um, and, and you yeah. know, being asked about the writer's strike in May, the L.A. Writer, Hollywood writer's strike, you know, he said, where the F is the money? You know, where is it going? I got a billion streams. Where's, you know, I can't even make a million dollars on that. Do the math. Right. So, yeah, so yeah, there's a lot going on. Snoop's complaint is that, you know, this new world with Spotify has really been bad for artists so he you know he's basically say you know everybody's making pennies off of millions of streams so it's not good so so the alternative is don't don't do spotify go and do uh music nfts and looking here at actually sort of the metrics so this is your first collection 329 eth in total volume so you know that's you know roughly you know, five roughly, roughly half a million maybe 600k something like that. And I assume that that's, that's what the price is now. So it's appreciated since the initial launch, but I would imagine, um, you know, you've done, you know, it, I, I would say you've done very well off of this, just based on this number right here. And is this, is this a typical number 
for music NFTs? Like how many people are doing this? So uh, definitely, you know, we've done really well with with Moonshot. And I think it, it was due to the way the collection was structured. And obviously, I don't want if there's any musicians listening, you know, I don't want anyone to think that it's like, you know, somewhat rigged or easy to do. We did turn up every single day for about 20 hours a day for a whole year and a half. <laughs> so it's like, wow. And, and it's more yeah. for when can, you can turn confirm. Up, you need promotion. Yeah, yeah, but it's very live and organic and really one-on-one -on -one kind of promotion. Like the people that you see 807 holders there, I pretty much hand collected myself through hours and hours and hours of literally performing live, like what we're doing right now, but on Twitter and singing. So um, yeah, I mean, the collection's done really well, you know, the across, you know, everything we have about 500 eth in secondary volume which you know is the money that people have exchanged in the secondary market and made through my music which is you know just insane if you tell that to a label they're going to think you're crazy you know that an artist like myself could ever do that um and i don't know if if those numbers are usual for music nfts i don't think there are a lot of collections that have reached that kind of, uh, you know, level of secondary volume, the floor price is double uh, what the mint price was, and it's kind of been steady there. So I feel like it has established kind of its own, you know, ground moonshot in particular. My second collection is still finding its place because it's much younger. Um, but um, yeah, I think, you know, it's definitely possible, but I'm also reading some of the comments, you know, it's, it's definitely hard work. Like you have to go out and find your community and, you know, try to innovate all the time with the tech and embrace the tech and not get stuck with one way, you know, cause the tech evolves every single day, you know? So, yeah. Can I, yeah. can I bust in Mark? I think it's important to point out one more thing relative yeah. to Violetta's grind here, which we, which we haven't talked about, um, which is the other dynamic that's going on between collectors and the artist is that music artists in particular are offering incredible utility to their NFT purchasers. It's not just about having a collectible, but if you collect certain types of them or certain numbers of them, and Violetta can walk you through how it works with Moonshot or Another Life, you actually are getting more benefits than that. Like Violetta, she holds concerts for her holders. You can go to a Zoom concert, which I've been to many of these. You get on Zoom and Violetta plays live for you. Okay, let me, you let me I want to get to that. Play show gonna, for you and all that. So but I wanna, like, I wanna, there's I wanna, an incredible dynamic going on here. Yes, and I do want to hear about that. So I just before that, I just want to summarize what I think I heard Violetta say, which okay. is over a period of a year and a half, uh, and promoting, and she promoted it, or Violetta, you promoted it on Twitter primarily. Mm -hmm. That was your primary promotional vehicle in spaces and just tweeting, I guess, right? And you were like doing it, you know, 15 hours a day for about a year and a half. You got about 800 uh, buyers of your stuff, and the the and when you minted it, I guess the uh, the mint price was about 250 ETH, and it's gone up since then. So so you so it's been a lot of hard work, but. You have done it, but the audience is a lot smaller also. The flip side is, you know, your audience is 800 people. It's not a million people on Spotify. So quite a, 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 a much smaller number of people are hearing this music uh, than would hear it on Spotify, but you've made a ton more money. Is that correct? Yeah, so just, to, just to clarify a couple of things. So actually those 800 people are only the holders of that first collection. We have mm -hmm. a total of about 1,400 uh, holders in our community. So almost double across okay. the, all my collections. And in order to find those 800, it took me about a couple of months. And then for a whole year and a half, like in order to get to that secondary volume, to get to that floor price, you know, you have to continue show up, you know, you can't just release your token and then leave. Like the fact that you continue to deliver utility and engage with your community uh, that's what brings in the secondary volume, which you make royalties from, of course. And, you know, uh, now I don't make a lot of royalties anymore because OpenSea cut them down, but that's a different story. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, the floor price yeah. and everything. And you are right. You know, the audience is much limited. So I have, you know, 1,400 people, but those are not 1,400 fans. Those are 1,400 mega fans, you mm -hmm. know, which is the, the key 
difference, in my opinion. Those are 1,400 people that have at least each spent $150 on me, which think about it, you know, for someone who is not famous, finding out, you know, 1,500 people almost to invest that amount, it's pretty significant. But of course, I have like 65,000 Twitter followers that follow my music and they go and listen for free everywhere. So we might have to find a solution for them too. But these NFTs that I put out are pretty expensive compared to maybe some others that I put out in the future to expand my audience. This was to build the core foundation of my community of people that I will bring with me forever pretty much. And I don't mind not having millions of people in my community because I don't know who they are. I don't know what they want. I don't know. I can't be on the journey with them. Um, and personally, I don't do it for the fame. I do it because my dream is to make music for a living because that's what I love doing. Mm -hmm. I don't aspire, you know, crowds screaming my name. That's an <laughs> ego, ego driven dream. <laughs> Mine yep. is a love dr driven dream, you know, the love for music. So so let's so tell me a little bit about the utility. So beyond just the fact that I've got this this uh, NFT, what do, what do I get? Um, what are the actual perks and, and and added utility that you have that you offer? Yeah, like Tony mentioned, you know, and he's got some of the same utilities as well in in, in his collections. But you know, what's fun is that you can kind of take you know, the similar formulas and then adapt them to whoever you are as an artist and what you have to offer. So, you know, personally, when I started, I had no money whatsoever to provide any of like, you know, any, any weird or fancy things. So I was like, what can I offer as a musician that I think is valuable? Um, and it cost me time rather than, than money. And it is simply engaging with my community, offering the Zoom concerts that I do every week. I did vinyl records for them, free prints. You know, once I minted my collection, I could afford to do those things. But the main thing is offer me as IP available to my community. So I'll write you a song that you have the license to, and you can use it for whatever business you've got going on. You can book me for a free show. You know, you can commission a song for whatever other thing and um, really just continue to provide, you know, the community with my presence, my music, education as much as I can, uh, free mints, of course, more music. You know, I just write more music. The best thing about music is that it is utility created out of thin air. So, other projects have to create, you know, some weird mechanism stake in this and that. An artist can just write a <laughs> brand new song for right. you. And it's only yours. How amazing is that? <laughs> so. Okay. So basically the utility is I own, I own some of your NFTs. I get exclusive access to Zoom concerts. Um, and, you know, kind of depending on how, how deep I am in your world, I can even go as high as to get a custom song made for me. So. Yeah. That's yeah. pretty cool. And I mean, I have a holder, one of my biggest holders right now who runs a business uh, in the Florida Keys for resorts, and he needed a song for the marketing campaign. And of mm. course, he requested a song from me, which, you know, if we were to do it in a more centralized way, right, using an attorney doing the whole deal, blah, 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 it would get expensive and I would charge more. But instead, he invested in me and he's saving money, but actually bringing value to his business because he's got a soundtrack for his campaign. Hmm. That's like a business strategy, actually. Super cool. So the other thing that I, you know, I was thinking about when when I when I first heard from Tony about what you were doing in this this whole little you know sub world in NFT land of music NFTs, my, my initial thought was, but NFTs have collapsed. It's like everything's at zero. Board apes are worth near nothing, and you know, and you know, everybody's a lot of people have lost a lot of a lot of money in NFTs, right? And so, but, but Tony was insisting that music NFTs were different and that the market dynamics were different. And, and that does seem to be the case. And so that is, is it just true for you only, or is that the music NFT scene in general? Like, I'm curious, like who else is doing this and how are they doing as well? Also, Tony, do you want to speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, so there's a handful of uh, big indie artists like Violetta who have had quite successful NFT drops, and they offer, you know, different, but, you know, kind of spiritually akin utility for their holders. And they're kind of in the 1% category of music artists doing these kind of NFTs. But they're, 
they're doing everything Violetta's is doing one way or another. They're, ga- they're creating gamified collections. They're offering extreme utility. They're connecting really deeply with their fans. Then there's sort of a larger base of folks who are using the technology of Web3 and effectively platforms that are emerging that use Web3 tech to offer music in the form of NFTs where people are still paying more than they pay. You know, they're paying more than the 99 cents typically for a song that you're getting. And they're getting a digital collectible in exchange for that, which includes the music, some piece of art. So it's sort of like buying a single, but you're buying it for 10 to 20 bucks kind of thing to U.S., um, and, you know, platforms like sound.xyz and there, there's, a, there's a bunch of things emerging there that are offering sort of more affordable, less high touch uh, music NFTs. And people are starting to do a lot there. Um, there's a bit of concern on the part of some of us that there's a bit of a race to the bottom on price points as these platforms want to get scale because yeah. they're venture funded businesses. And you know how these work, Mark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're looking for numbers, user numbers in the millions to billions it turns into the same movie I think we've seen potentially with Spotify. So there's some concern, though. Uh, the people who are coming out and doing this as startups now are they're making the right noises and they're working re- you know, closely with artists to make sure that doesn't happen. But, you know, we've also seen the movie before. So there's just a concern that, you know, they're going to go the way of venture funded companies. They're going to need to scale more and more. They're going to squeeze the artists. They're going to you know, take as much profit as they can. So there, there's a big concern there about anything that gets centralized. But, you know, to answer your because ultimately they become centralized again. And what we've been talking about right. is the decentralization of music. It is going straight to your customers. It is using the tech as supply chain, as enabler not being dominated by the tech and being, you know, just in another controlled distribution scheme effectively, right? So when you get to these things that scale up, there's always that, you know, question and danger. And then there's other folks, you know, there's, there's plenty of other people who are like, Here, here's just a tool. We just want to get paid. Like it, it, this is a tool and there's enough people using it. We can scale up. We're not trying to control the whole stack, right? So we'll see. But yeah, to answer your question directly, there are a lot of other people who are definitely making income can't speak to whether or not they're you know thriving in this world because they they'll do a single drop on sound and that might net them you know two or three k for a song but mm-hmm. feel out of how much does it cost to make a song in the studio <laughs> i mean typically more than two or three k unless you're doing it all yourself yeah. at home right yeah which is also you know i i feel like at this point artists could you know, an artist like me could say like, okay, I'll just sell a song for 20 bucks, but I'll just record it at home. You know, it's like that kind of thing. You can also do that. The, be- the best thing is that you can be super creative, you know, and, and like really adapt, uh, you know, the technology around what you're doing. So, you know, at the end of the day, uh, I, I support kind of always, but yeah. Yeah. And you've even thought about it for some of your other songs you said, right? You might do some that are more affordable or right. Yeah. Well, yeah, right. Because that's the thing. Like once you have a a strong like core community, like with everything, right? Think about the Board Apes example, right? They created their core, uh, you know, Diamond Hand. Well, I don't know so much anymore, but, (laughs) (laughs) you know, 10,000 holders or whatever for the first 10K. And then they expand their supply and they, you know, lower the price. And of course, the floor prices, you know, reflect the, the, the supply amounts and stuff. So I feel like you can apply that to music artists, too. You know, once you've built your strong community, a lot of people struggle to grasp the concept of music NFTs. And I'm not sure why, because I struggle to grasp the concept, concept of apes, to be honest. Like, why would you? <laughs> You yeah. know what I mean? Like, I feel like music makes so much more sense uh, than just collecting a picture of a monkey. And I get it. It's a collectible. But like why music is exactly the same way. You know, it's just people are used to consuming music like McDonald's, like Big Macs, you know, but it, it's not that way, really. Yeah. Have you guys ever been to an NFT uh, conference? Yes. Like either one of you? Oh, yeah. You have. Yeah, mm-hmm. I went to one here. I went to NFT LA twice, actually. And, you know, I, I, you know, the previous years I'd spent sort of on the road going to every crypto conference on Earth, um, mostly in sort of the ICO phase, but also in the DeFi phase of things. And those those people and, and you know, talks and products were very sophisticated with like, you know, bonding curves and this and that and, um, you know, stable coin mechanisms. And, um, and then, then I went to the NFT conference and it was very much like the jersey of crypto. And, you know, we're instead of instead of these like sophisticated things, there are all these booths that were like, OK, my business model is it's a ghost and it's a rapper, but it's in 1700. 
And like, that's it. That's the business model. And, you know, and somehow these people are, are actually making money with that. Right. But it was a very, very, very different vibe. And, and most of it, I just didn't understand. Like, I got to be honest, I'm mystified by it also. So, but a lot of those projects crashed at the end of last year. And a lot of those projects crashed. The Aladdis didn't, and these other music artists didn't. And that's what I was talking to you about, Mark, if you remember. Yeah, so yeah. these projects survived that um, bear market of last year because, again, the artists are connecting with their fans, are offering real utility on an ongoing basis. And the people who are collecting belief in the, believe in the growth of these uh, artists and their projects. Well, I think it's, I think it's two things too. I think Violetta, like now that I've heard her music, like uh, it, she's, I mean, the, the music is very sophisticated, right? Like as, as sort of a pseudo musician, I can hear that there's a lot of, there's a lot of very well crafted bits and things in there above and beyond most musicians for sure. And, and I think that's sort of, you know, that's one part of it. You hear the quality. And, 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 but it's also poppy, like, right. It's also accessible. It's not so intellectual that you can't, you know, it's like jazz that you can't follow the average person. Can, it's actually very pleasurable and poppy to listen to at the same time, which is sort of what the Beatles and other people mastered as well. That sort of blend of those two worlds. Right. So, so I think that that's one part of it. And the other part of it is that you are just, you're working, you're marketing, you are, you know, you know, each one of those 800 people is hard won. And probably took like 40 hours of work or I don't know, whatever. I don't know what the ratio is, but probably probably there was a whole lot of work that went into each one of those people. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, one on one sales. Right. Kind of. So and I, I think I, so. I don't think most people could succeed at this. I, I think that's the conclusion I'm kind of reaching because I don't think most people have the talent and most people have the, you know, moxie to go out and do the sales. Like, like a, lot, a lot of artists don't like the sales part of it. Right. Like it, See, I look at it, Mark, like it's like the indie bands of the 80s and 90s we came up with. They would just do it on a local scene. They would do it in Seattle. They'd do it in Boston. I was in the Boston music scene. And you'd, you'd find, that's how you found your thousand true fans at the Rat, at the nightclub. The Rat you know? Skeller, yes. I yeah, the Rat and Skeller. Exactly. I gigged <laughs> there plenty of times. And so, you know, now that's it just it's divorced from geography. I mean, you've got a global audience and you've got these digital tools which help you connect a lot better and, you know, sort of much more asynchronously than the live gigs. But to me, it's got that same feel of just an indie music scene, um, which doesn't need, again, back to Violeta's point, you don't need millions of people screaming your name in a stadium. Right. Yep. I mean, so I agree. There's people that make audiences busking. You know, they go on tour every single yep. day of the year. And it's basically the same thing, but just more comfortable because I do it from my chair. You know, <laughs> and that's, yeah, yeah, it's a little bit, a little bit nicer. All right. So, so I want to show uh, I want to I want the people to listen to a uh, little bit of Judgment Day here, which this is Tony's thing. So this is so this is a rock opera slash musical. Uh, and Tony, you did you uh, you put it up on Spotify. So uh, what, what, oh, yeah, what, there's, what there's a I whole story there. That? Yeah, and so first, let's, let's um, play a little bit of it first. Of let's all. play Sorry, a little, and then I'll talk. People what should I play? Which gonna... which song do you think I should play here? I mean, like, do you want to either symphonic, like the overture, or just you can play the track that's minting right now, which is uh, track number two. If this goes on, let's do that. This one. is it. Okay, I'll play this one. If this goes on. If this goes on, that audio's a little twitch, but I think people can get this. Nice Sorry, I, is the audio not coming through? Yeah, it's a little squished. I don't know what's going on there. Yeah, it's playing that StreamYard. Back. StreamYard's not going to yeah, carry the It was okay for me. What's that? It was okay for me. Okay, maybe that was StreamYard, but. Yeah, what you were hearing is the opening track uh, after the overture dies down, the lights come up, and you hear... This is musical theater, by the way. You hear Thomas, the protagonist, basically railing against all the evils in the world because we're so irrational and we're just on a collision course with destruction. The story's about the end of the world. Uh, boy meets girl, boy gets girl. She's, she's a woman of faith, and he's like a total skeptic and agnostic. And they kind of have a dialogue about faith and reason and all these things uh, against the backdrop of geopolitical upheaval and eventually a cosmic battle between good and evil and the world ends. And the, Thomas, the protagonist, tells you all about it at the end. Uh, very much inspired story-wise by like uh, early rock musicals like Jesus Christ Superstar, but musically more like Tommy by The Who, if you're familiar with that. 
Um, and yeah, so I wrote that years ago and finally made the record, like I was saying at the top of the hour, um, and was thinking about how to distribute it when I came across Web3. Now, this is very different, but I think it's a similar story to uh, where Violetta and these independent music artists are going. I think uh, musical theater could use an overhaul in terms of the business. And this is musical theater. So we're talking about doing something new with live theater meets music. So music NFTs might be the vehicle to deliver the music to holders in the beginning, but it's also going to be the funding vehicle to actually do live production. So I'm going to take the proceeds okay. from this project and workshop the live show. And I've already got some production partners for that, and they'll be announcing that pretty soon. And so I'm super excited about it. And, and so I was so excited about the tools of Web3 and these wonderful artists and the communities they're building and then the folks that I've been meeting that I quit my day job uh, and, and I've been unemployed. Well, now I'm employed full time as a musician. Yes, I quit my day job from tech. That, um, that uh, company, Lamina One, I was talking about, founded by Neil Stevenson. I was having a great time there, built a new blockchain tech for the open metaverse. But like I said, I need to be doing the creator side of this. There's plenty of people who can do the tech now. And after flogging 3D tech for 30 years, I think I could take a break and get back <laughs> to my first love, music. So yeah, that's how I'm doing this. And I'm super excited about the project. And yeah, we're selling them as music NFTs. We'll be offering some different kind of utility. This is live theater. You collect certain kinds of these NFTs. You're going to get VIP tickets when this becomes a live show. And so we're thinking about it that way. And again, it's all about empowering uh, independent artists like myself who would never have a chance to get listens on Spotify without really paying dearly for it. In addition to paying for a record I made, There's no way that's going to happen, Mark. So it's up on Spotify and Apple music right now, but when I sell the NFT collection out, it comes down from web two platforms. Oh, so you're going to only from be available to holders or maybe people who purchase, you know, tickets to a live you know, performance of it or a live stream of it, but it's only going to be available through web three mechanisms going forward. Um, there's, there's no reason to feed the click beast that is web two music streaming. I mean, they're just getting more plays. I, I don't get much. I mean, right now it's basically, I could put it on SoundCloud. It's basically a nice place to host the music so everyone can listen to it and easy links for me to share. Right. And thank you right. for that Spotify. But other than that, I'm not getting much value out of it. Honestly, Tony, so, I don't know if you see yeah. the comments, but you just, uh, Todd just minted one. You just oh it. yeah, there, there we, we go. go. Right. Thank you, brother. So how many? So, how many uh, so your collection, uh, Tony. How many? How many mints are there in it? Is it just? A, I think it's like a hundred. So right? it's going to be a thousand with a thousand. the whole collection, but I'm dropping them a song at a time. So the way Violetta had done Moonshot, which creates all kinds of complexities, by the way. But I decided to do this rather than one mega collection of a thousand and just. I've watched these artists really grind on what that takes and and you know to build their audience around that. And it's like, why don't I drop a song at a time, see who my tr true fans are, really want to support this. They'll know what song they're getting. They're getting generative art uh, made my, by my wife, Marina Berlin, who's an incredible visual artist that's sort of like a divination deck, similar to a tarot. So there's some cool, you know, four elements, numbered cards and things like that. So they're going to get some collectibles that are going to have some fun value later as we start kind of exploring the magical universe that is Judgment Day. And so uh, there's 100 uh, NFTs in this first drop. And we have sold now, I think that makes 54 with Todd. Thank you, Todd. Um, so we're more than halfway minted. And early next week, you have placeholder art. If you look at Judgment Day by Tony Parisi on OpenSea right now, you're going to see placeholder art, which is the album cover. Uh, but we're going to do the reveal next week for holders, uh, you know, such as Todd and other people that we know. Um, so, yeah, I'm really excited about that. This is a great way for me to learn and explore. And what we're going to do with each drop is Marina is going to subtly change the background art. They'll still be the four elements, but they'll look different visually. There'll be more uh, gamified factors introduced, some special cards brought in and all kinds of cool extra things. And this gives us a way to kind of do the collection a little bit more agile so we can learn what people like. And then, you know, we'll do updates throughout. And I'm, my, my goal also was the songs tell a story. It's in linear fashion. Um, I'm going to deliver the music that way too. So the next one will be basically the next scene from the collection that's you know going to be included in it. So you'll you'll progress through the story as well. So I thought that would be all interesting to experiment with again. Af actually, uh, after having watched all these other artists do their collections. Hey Tony, so, well, this is yeah. so you're on Open Sea, right? Just to be just to clarify. 
So yeah, but you you don't mint it on OpenSea. You would mint it by going to judgmentdaymusical.com, the website. There we there's go. a mint okay. page there. And it's it's front yep. and center. Yeah, um, but you can see, if you're on OpenSea, you can see that anything that's been minted already. You can see what people are collecting by typing that in. But again, you'll see placeholder art for now. Yeah. Hey, Violetta, so, did um, you do something on on ordinals also? Because you yeah, you started off sort of in the Ethereum world, and you know everyone who watches the shows knows I'm a big ordinals BRC twenty fan. Um, oh. So. Yeah. So did you, so tell me what, what did you do on ordinals? Yeah. Uh, very exciting, you know, for me to dive into the world of Bitcoin in that way. And it's kind of story history is kind of repeating itself for me, dove into crypto because of music, Ethereum first, and then into Bitcoin because of ordinals. So I'm always like, I'm never chasing the money i'm really just chasing where can i just print my art like everywhere <laughs> that's yep. like basically what i'm doing so when i first heard of ordinals i immediately was charmed uh you know the idea of being able to put anything you know just a stamp of of whatever you want on a sat right and first thing i thought is how can i put my music on a satoshi right because yep. i know this is going to be there forever um, and, you know, it will transcend my lifetime, my kid's lifetime, hopefully. And, you know, when it stops mining, then it's going to be that's it. Right. There's nothing there's going to be no more. Um, and so I decided to write a song uh, purpose purposely for this. Um, and, you know, there's a whole kind of layered narrative around it. Uh, my career turned 10 in May of 2023. So because I started exactly 10 years ago. So I wrote a song to commemorate the 10 year anniversary, a song called 10 years, um, kind of encapsulating the past decade, uh, which is a pretty big deal, you know, for me to be able to say like, oh God, I made it the first 10 years, you know, it was definitely a struggle, but I made it. Um, and now I'm putting my music on Bitcoin, like the most weird, like vinyl version of a vinyl ever um and how did you do that like tell, tell me a little bit about how you did it yeah so we had problems because obviously the file size that you can inscribe on a sat is, is super super limited so that exactly. was that was the main issue and of course i told you that it couldn't be done i yeah. was like no way she was like i'm gonna do this i'm like you cannot you're not gonna be able to do it yeah, everyone actually told me, no, you're not going to be able to do it. You know, how are you going to inscribe like the max, you know, um, size is like four megabytes, but all the Bitcoiners are going to hate you because you're going to clog up the network <laughs> and you're going to yep. have to work with, you know, someone who's running a node. Like, you know, it's going to be super complicated. It's going to cost you 10 Bitcoin. And I was like, guys, like, calm down. We're going to find a way. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I really wanted an image to go with it as well. So the song I wrote, I wrote it with this idea in mind. This song is going to be lo-fi. You know, I'm going to be able okay. to crunch it down to 400 kilobytes or less. And it's a two and a half minute song with an image. So it's practically a video. And so far, it's the longest video ever inscribed on Bitcoin. Mm. Um, and it's 350 kilobytes in total size. And it sounds exactly like I had imagined it when I wrote it, which was like, imagine something coming out of an old radio from the 1930s that mm. has that taste of past in it. Because I'm thinking yep. in 120 years, we're going to be listening to this and it's going to be old, but it's gonna, not going to get scratched because it, you know, it's going to sound the way it sounded back then. But I wanted to give it this flavor. Um so yeah, we did it. So like and something on a big troll, it's like, hello, my darling, hello, my baby, hello, my like that kind of, you know, old. It's like wax cylinder. It's like the wax, like cylinder, wax cylinder, like the first audio inscription, basically. Yeah, it's yeah. a sort of classical it's like, vibe. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. the first music. Uh, it's the first song with visuals inscribed, and it's on an uh, uncommon set. And you you follow, oh, right? Oh, really? Interesting. It's, so it's on an it's, uncommon set. The interesting thing is that it's on an uncommon, an early one, 2013 one, mind the day I did my X Factor audition. So the day my career oh, wow. ever started, May 26, 2013 at 1 p.m. Central European time, I was in line in Milan with my ukulele on my back trying to get past my first audition. And that uncommon was being mined. And 10 oh, years later, crazy. I found it and put my song on it. So... Yeah. That's amazing that you found it because that's that's hard to do. Those are very difficult to find is my understanding. Well, I do want to shout out Rare Satoshi Society, who are a team of sat hunters that actually go out and pan 
sats and they found <laughs> it and yeah so they sponsored me with it right mm -hmm. wow that's wild so where so where is where was it so where was this um where was this sold or has it been sold yet I have not sold it yet. I, it's very, you know, I'm kind of emotionally attached to it. And, okay. uh, but of course I want to sell it. And cause the, the whole point behind this song is this is a gift to the community. Basically it's me giving myself as an artist, I'm relinquishing my rights to the music as well. So as soon as the piece sells, it becomes CC zero, both the art, which is made by my dad, by the way, and the music will, basically have no it'll be copyright free um so you know people will be able to use it however they want um but you know it's such an important piece to me that i wanted to like li live with it for a second you know like mm -hmm. own it sure. for a little bit like it really does mean a lot to me but i think i will put it up for sale probably do an auction if there's anyone interested in the audience you know only serious buyers uh <laughs> yeah no hey, todd todd wants to know where they can where you can find this now it's on ord.io right or any anybody that can view ordinals right? yeah ord.io is where you know the indexer you can you can look at it um it's on my twitter profile as well as my pin tweet you can find oh okay okay that's probably the easiest way yep it's such yeah. a beautiful song too yeah, and I mean, you know, it really is the wax recording. I mean, metaphorically as well. It's not just the audio quality that V is referring to, but it's literally one of the earliest recordings of any kind of music on an ordinal, right? I mean, I think someone else had done music a little bit before that, Violetta, but this is the first like full song and video, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, it's like the the closest you get to like a Spotify thing on 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 Bitcoin. You know, there were MP3s inscribed before, you know, but this was like. A complete work in my opinion that's mm -hmm. just sitting you know and the fact that it's on the uncommon the the, the market value of that early because it's an early uncommon right 2013 some people lost their bitcoin from then and everything the value sure. of the uncommon itself is like three grand alone uh at plus you know all the other things but so yeah it's it's very exciting that's why i'm kind of taking my time to sell i wanted to go to someone who really like understands you know the value of it so yeah no that's it's pretty amazing because most of the most of the, the ethereum nft people don't even know about this world of ordinals um to the degree anywhere to near the degree of of um detail that you do right that's actually super impressive and you know let alone most musicians don't even know about that you know they, but even within the world of nfts most most people don't know about that so it's su super impressive and uh, that you found your way to it very early. It's like, yeah, it's impressive it's you found your way at all. But it's this. Early is great. That's amazing. You know how I found out about ordinals? Violetta sent me the white paper. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Well, yeah. When you, I thought Mark I was the tech innovator. Said, yeah, but when Mark first said, "Oh, we do nerdy things in here," I was laughing inside because I'm like. He doesn't know that we're huge nerds. <laughs> we haven't <laughs> left the world of nerds. I was trying and we haven't. Musicians oh, well. can be really, really nerdy and geeky. And that's yeah, what yeah. That, that, that much has been made clear. So, mm -hmm. all right. So let's, uh, we're almost out of time here, but I do want to do a little bit of news. So uh, we're going to go, I think we're going to do the eyeball coin because that's, uh, that's sort of the story of the week, right? So you guys, uh, if you heard about uh, World Coin, which, um, which is this, which is, it's been around for a little bit but it's um, in, in concept, but it finally launched this week. And the idea is that it's a new cryptocurrency um, that that's tied to biometrics. So in order for you to get a working wallet, you have to scan your eyeball. So there's an iris biometric tied to your wallet and your wallet. You, you cannot have a wallet unless you also that, that works anyway, that can hold world coins unless you scan your eyeball. So the, the, the company and oh yeah. And the last piece is, um, the same guy that did OpenAI or ChatGPT is the same uh, guy that's behind WorldCoin, um, Alex. And I'm spacing his last name, but um, but you know, same dude. And do you remember his name, Tony? I'm so sorry. I'm Sam Altman. It. Sam Altman. Sorry, sorry. I'm trying to think of. Yeah. So Sam Altman is is the same. It's the same person behind both. And um, I forget who Alex is, but but basically they're talking about the launch of WorldCoin, and they claim that they've scanned 1.7 million irises so far using 210 devices and uh, it's mostly in buenos aires lisbon nairobi delhi and bangalore i've also heard they've they've got long lines in japan 
So, you know, they're having some success with this. When you get your eyeball scanned, you get 25 free world coins. Um, unless you live in the United States, if you live in the United States, you are not allowed to own world coin, which that's really bizarre. Right. And yet they actually, I, I did, I went and looked into it. They actually have a world coin eyeball scanner on the third street promenade here in Santa Monica. So you can go get your eyeball scan to get your wallet enabled, but you cannot, you still cannot own world coin, uh, or get 25 free coins. So, so that's, that's basically what they're, they're, uh, they're saying their success rate is. No idea whether this is true or not, but that's what they're claiming. Um, let me just uh, move on to the next slide here. Sorry, I was looking for my – there we go. So, uh, so this is a report from somebody who um, actually went to go get their eyeball scanned. I thought about doing it, but to me it's too dirty. I just don't want my biometrics out there floating around. I just don't like the idea of it. That's my own personal opinion. So this person disagreed with me. He was like, I read the white paper. I think it's cool. Um, and they went to go get their eyeball scanned. And they were asked um, if if they would be willing to share the iris scan image for analytics and be uh, and save being scanned again in case of an orb upgrade. So basically, even though Worldcoin has promised that the iris scans cannot leave the orb or cannot leave their purview, clearly it can. So it's it's clearly not as secure as they are claiming, or their claims are not correct. So the iris data is not technically not restricted from leaving the orb device. Anyway, I'm going to throw it first to you, Tony. What do you think about WorldCoin, and what do you think about all this stuff? Uh, thanks. I hate it. Um, I think I'm <laughs> a little too old for all of this, number one. Number two, I feel like uh, every science fiction dystopian trope is like packed into one thing with this. The, yeah. the founder of the most powerful AI company in the world is now getting all our biometric data connecting it to us financially. I mean, I literally, this is literally Book of Revelation lore that it's included in my musical Judgment Day. There's a song, I don't know if you got to this one yet, Mark, it's called The Eye in the Sky. It's the same singer as the other song you like, Simon Says. Yeah. You know, he's a, he's, a, he's like kind of an indie Eminem up and coming Kanye type of artist. And then he turns into a shill for the global one world government that's going to eat our souls in act two. <laughs> And yep. so for me, this is like, this is the dystopian nightmare. So I think it's freaking awful. There you go. But maybe I'm just too old. I'd love to hear what Violetta has to say about yeah, it. Yeah, Viola, what do you think about all this? <clears throat> I mean, I kind of agree with Tony, but at the same time, it's unstoppable. And I think it's really up to us to make the best out of it. You know, I, I, I don't. You know, I remember there is that episode of Black Mirror where they have that little chip behind their ear where they can rewind memories and stuff and like you you remember that that one it's called the entire was, history of you yeah. yeah yeah and i that was my favorite episode uh you know anything to do with like eyes and so like even the apple vision pro thing where it's like you know you, everything is like in your eyes like i i like i i like that i know it's weird dystopian and then probably really scary but at the same time you know maybe Maybe. I don't know. Like we have so many scams with crypto, so many things that, you know, deter people from coming in that I don't know. Maybe these things might help a little bit. I, I have no clue, but I'll just sit and watch, see what happens. You know, at this point, I don't get surprised anymore. That's the thing. <laughs> so, Yeah. The, the sort of the pitch from WorldCoin is, is that they believe that uh, proof of personhood is required. Like that's the pitch. Like, why would you go get your eyeball scanned? Why is this necessary? Well, in the future, the AIs are going to be so prevalent that proving that you're a biological entity um, and tying the, you to money, that's going to actually be something that we're, that's a problem we have to solve. So by the people who created, well, by the people who created are creating that problem, it's founded yeah. by the very people who are creating this AI problem. So well, it's, do you think it's a problem? A protection racket to me. Um, I don't, I, I don't think it's. I mean, it could be a problem someday. I don't think we're anywhere near that. Doesn't feel like I a mean, pressing problem to me. Yeah, to be honest. not not at all. One hundred percent. Have you guys heard of the? I think it's called Oddity. Did you hear about that one? Where it's a new AI kind of tech company where you scan your face and they'll tell you the beauty products. Like they'll actually make a a, a complete, very thorough scan of your skin tone, your melanin levels, and like the way you are really like aesthetically looking and they'll just 
literally come up with the best combination of makeup and like beauty products. And this has gone like the, the, you know, the stock price has gone wild lately because, you know, people are excited about it. And yeah, it's kind of a similar, similar idea. I think. Yeah, but that's an application. That would make sense to me. That's a beauty application. Totally cool. Um, I got to tell you all this stuff, like, yeah, this is why I'm glad I just stepped off the tech hamster wheel for a while. I I mean, I'm feeling very liberated because I'm just going to go write songs about all this. I'm just going to go make yeah. art about it because it's exceedingly <laughs> totally creepy. Yeah. Yeah. So Vitalik, so Vitalik is still uh, Vitalik Buterin of Ethereum fame. So Vitalik weighed in and wrote like when when this when when WorldCoin launched, Vitalik wrote a very, very, very long uh, and detailed think piece um, all about what he thinks about WorldCoin and biometric proof of personhood. Um, and he basically sort of goes through and analyzes all the things that can go wrong. So, you know, obviously I can go get my eyeball scanned, uh, but then I could take my ID and sell it to someone. Right. And of course, that's going to happen. Uh, I could even sell it to an AI. If an AI is in the market for, uh, you know, black market biometric uh, wallet, there's nothing that says I can't sell my ID to uh, to an AI. Now the AI can pose as a biologic. Right. Um, sounds like a William Gibson novel already. Right. <laughs> so um, and then, you know, ultimately, he, he basically comes up with his you know, uh, trade-offs between all the different ways in which we can prove personhood, mm-hmm. you know, everything from sort of a social graph where, you know, sir, a person can be said to be a biologic if there are, you know, 10 other biologics which verify like, you know, yeah, I know Tony Parisi. I've known him for 30 years. He's definitely a person. He's not an AI. I vouch for him. And if you can get like 10 other people to say that, then probably you're a biologic. So that's one, that's a social graph based approach. And these are sort of the trade-offs between all of them. And then bottom line, he's kind of like, you know, he's sort of neutral. That's ultimately where Vitalik ends up is he's sort of like, yeah, there's lots of different ways and different approaches. Some of them are good. Some of them are bad. Ultimately, we'll just have to wait and see if, it, you know, this works out in the end. So he's not he's very sort of noncommittal. But I, I don't he doesn't really strongly believe that this solution will work in the end, I don't think so. I just want to respond to something in the comments by block bites because I don't want to join the chat and somehow lose this window. Um, yeah, I'm working on that musical about the dystopian nightmare. It's called Metaverse the Musical. That's that's the third one in progress. Oh, just no, not a know. Metaverse musical, musical. Oh, yeah. And that's we're collabing with a bunch of our Web3 musician friends on that. And it's literally about all the, But it's a comedy. It's a Gilbert and Sullivan style farce. I decided to not do uh three really sad i've got got a middle one in there too but yeah so this one's going to be super fun and like really jazz hands and and total farce um but yeah now we have to incorporate the orb into it for sure we're we're still uh this one's still a work in progress yeah and it's called the Um, orb of all things too that's like it's like like they're trying to make it creepy right totally (laughs) so okay well i think uh, look we're coming up a little bit past the hour here so uh we're going to start wrapping up so, Violetta, once again, thank you so much for being on the show. How do people find you on Twitter? Why don't you run us through your run us through your plugs? Yeah, for sure. Um, my Twitter account is Zeroni Violetta, so my last name first, and then my first name. Or you can visit my website, VioettaZeroni.com. For all the information, I am currently on a little Twitter break. Um, but I should be back next week. I host Twitter Spaces every weekday at 2 p.m. Eastern. Uh, for the people to come in and listen to some music, we host a lot of musicians. We talk about crypto, NFTs, ordinals also. Um, and yeah, if Open C, you know, Another Life, my second collection, Moonshot, it's all there. So, yeah. Okay. Tony, what about you? Uh, at sign Aura Deluxe, A U R A D E L U X E is my Twitter handle, judgmentdaymusical.com. It's got all the information about the musical. If you look up my name and Judgment Day on Spotify or Apple Music, you can hear all the tunes. Uh, I'll be there in the spaces with Violetta pretty much every day, and I'll be doing my own until we mint out that first drop. We're more than halfway through, so I hope to see you guys all there. Super cool. Okay. Well, my name is Mark Jeffrey. This has been Across the Chains. We'll see you all next time. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark.